We're going to talk today about this blockbuster free trade deal that the Canadian government is trying to negotiate with the European Union. It's called CETA, Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement. Sounds very impressive, but it will mean big trouble for Canadian workers, for Canadian industries. And we're going to run through some of the economic costs of that agreement if, in fact, it went ahead. Now, this is what happens every time the government tries to sell us on a new free trade agreement. First of all, they pay for an economic study which supposedly proves that the free trade agreement will benefit Canada and benefit Canadians. Then, they put it out in the media and reporters cite that study, they mention the study in the bottom line results, as if it were fact, as if it was a proven fact that free trade will necessarily benefit Canadians. And anyone who then opposes free trade, they paint us as if we're economically illiterate, uh, that we're opposing it out of ignorance or out of some kind of narrow vested interest. But in fact, we aren't economically illiterate. We are economically literate because we live in the real world where we have to worry about keeping our job and whether our industries have a future or not. The problem is very few people, not the reporters, not the politicians, actually dig in to examine how that economic model that came up with those results was built, what the assumptions were, how it actually works. And nobody ever goes back to check after the fact whether the model's predictions were actually true. They could do that because we've been debating free trade in Canada, as you know, for a quarter century. For a quarter century, they've been giving us these economic predictions from their models and pretending that they are fact. So we can go back and check the evidence, and in fact, we'll do that uh, in this report, but the evidence is not there to suggest that free trade always benefits us. In fact, it hurts us. This debate now over the comprehensive economic and trade agreement, the CETA, with the Europeans is like deja vu all over again, okay? The same thing is happening. In 2008, late 2008, the Canadian government and the EU jointly issued an economic report which said Canada would get $12 billion gain in our GDP from free trade with Europe. Then, reporters begin citing this as if it's fact. It, uh, it also was a CGE model, computable general equilibrium model, just like the ones that came before it. But nobody ever goes through to actually check how the model was built and how it worked, what the methodology was, whether it was realistic or not, or was the number just picked out of thin air. And nobody checks to see if the predictions of the model actually make sense, given what we know about the real world of trade and investment flows between Canada and Europe. So that's what we're going to look at in this study, in this talk today is looking at the reality of our trade with Europe, how it is structured today, and what the effects, the likely effects of a free trade agreement with Europe are going to be. Now, you don't actually need a computable general equilibrium model to do this. It isn't rocket science. You could actually just look at the pattern of trade today between Europe and Canada. This graph shows, this pie chart shows current European exports to Canada, about $45 billion a year, quite a bit of uh, exports. The red portion shows the, the share of Europe's exports to Canada that are value-added, high-tech manufactured goods. The black part shows what is more resource-oriented, agricultural products, less processed products. So Europe exports a lot to Canada, 45 billion a year, and most of it is high-value-added, high-technology manufactured goods. Compare that to what we sell the other way, going back to Canada. This pie chart shows that we only sell about 30 billion dollars a year in Europe, so quite a bit less than we buy from Europe. Also, half of our exports to Europe are these basic resource products, oil, coal, minerals, agricultural products, things that aren't processed, things that don't have technology or value added in them, just mostly stuff that we dig out of the ground and sell to the Europeans. So two problems become evident immediately. We sell less to Europe than we buy from Europe. Number two, the stuff we sell is very unsophisticated resource products rather than high-tech value added manufactured goods. Okay. Here's another reality of the trade today. Look at the tariffs on trade in the two directions to imagine what is going to happen when we take those tariffs away. That's what a free trade agreement does in part, eliminates those tariffs. The Europeans have an average tariff on our exports to them of 2.2%. But Canada has a higher tariff on imports from Europe. More than half again as high, about 3.5% is our average tariff. So put those two things together. They're selling 50% more to us than we're selling to them. And the tariffs that they will see eliminated in Canada are more than 50% higher than the tariffs that would be eliminated in Europe. 
So even without a computable general equilibrium model, we can immediately see that a free trade agreement between Canada and Europe will give a much bigger boost to Europe's exports to Canada than it will to Canada's exports to Europe because they have much more going here in the first place and the tariff reduction under free trade agreement will be larger for them. The inevitable result is our existing trade deficit with Europe, which is in excess of $15 billion a year, will get worse. That's what you can see just by looking at the existing real world data, um, the existing trade relationships which we have, and incredibly, the joint study which the Canadian government and the EU released confirms that. They do acknowledge that the existing trade deficit will get much wider under a free trade agreement. So the joint report does acknowledge that our trade deficit with Europe will widen, they estimate, by about 8.5 billion euros. The report from the government actually uses euros as their currency. Yet they still claim that Canada will enjoy big gains in gross domestic product and national income of almost the same amount, 8.5 billion euros or about $12 billion Canadian. So how is it that our trade performance can deteriorate, which they acknowledge, yet our economy will grow? That is rocket science or perhaps alchemy. It's like turning water into wine, uh, if you like. Uh, how can you take a negative trade result and have a positive gain for our GDP as a result? Um, one interesting point to keep in mind, this study that was released, it was released jointly by the European government and the Canadian government, it was 100% made in Europe. It was European economists uh, who have consulted for the EU before who took one of their existing models and rejigged it to examine the impacts of a Canada-EU deal. So there was no real Canadian input to this. And uh, I don't know if anyone else finds that a little bit suspicious. I think of uh, two boys in a schoolyard. You know, one's a European, one's a Canadian boy. The European boy comes to the Canadian boy and says, OK, you give me 16 billion euros and I'll give you 8 billion euros. OK? And the Canadian boy would naturally say, why? That doesn't sound fair. OK? But then the European guy points to his enforcer, you know, a big burly economist behind him who comes out with a big study and says, this will be good for you. It doesn't look like it'll be good for you, but it will be good for you. Shouldn't we be doing our own analysis as Canadians of an agreement like this in terms of how it's going to affect Canada instead of using a second-hand European report and then actually believing that this is uh, going to be beneficial for Canada? We are actually negotiating with the Europeans here. We're supposed to be in a bit of an arm wrestle, yet our government is using the European study uh, to inform them. How do they do that? How did they milk a silk purse out of a sow's ear, if you like? How did they take a trade deficit and convert it into an economic gain? First of all is the standard tricks that they have played on every CGE model, computable general equilibrium model, that they have used in all of the free trade debates. Those models are all based on a set of incredibly unrealistic assumptions, and I'll quickly run through them. They assume full employment, so they assume that no one is unemployed. So don't worry that you'll lose your job because of free trade. You can't. The model assumes you'll be fully employed. They also assume a supply-constrained economy. What that means is the Canadian economy, both before free trade and after free trade, will produce as much as it possibly can. There'll be no impact on how much we produce. The only impact of trade is therefore on exactly what we produce. And this obviously is not remotely true. We see unemployment and unutilized capacity in factories that are closing around us every day. They also assume uniform factor pricing. That means every worker in Canada gets exactly the same wage. So you don't have to worry that a high wage industry, like say the auto industry, is going to lose jobs and that you'll end up working at Tim Hortons instead. It doesn't matter because the auto worker and the Tim Hortons worker make the same wage. Sounds realistic? Not exactly. They assume a single representative household. So the model assumes that the whole country is composed of one household that shares all the income that comes in. So there's no question of there being winners and losers. We're all one big happy family as, uh, as a country. If you believe that, walk down to Rosedale or some other rich neighborhood in Canada and ask to share the money that's being enjoyed there. You'll get arrested, okay? The model assumes no international capital mobility. So a company cannot take a plant and move it from one country to another because the workers are cheaper. The model just assumes it can't be done. The model also assumes that trade will be balanced between Canada and Europe and all the other uh, trading partners, so you can't have a trade deficit. None of those assumptions are true. In fact, they don't remind me of Canada, a capitalist country. It sounds like a utopia to me. Full employment, producing as much as you can, sharing everything, and keeping all your capital at home. 
I vote for that system, okay? But that isn't the system we live under, right? We live under uh, something very different. So those are the standard assumptions that show up in every computable general equilibrium model. Now it's interesting to note of the $12 billion gain that the study forecast, only about 20% of that gain actually came from that set of ridiculous assumptions applied to the process of tariff reduction on both sides. That explains about 20%. Even those far-fetched uh, assumptions can only explain about 2.5 billion out of the 12 billion. Okay? How did they get to $12 billion gain? Well, they had to go even further with their assumptions. Okay? There's an extra set of what I call super duper assumptions built into this particular model. Not a standard CGE model, but this particular model of the European case. And these are these super duper assumptions. First of all, they assume that because of the elimination of non-tariff barriers, which they can't measure and they don't try to estimate, they just snap their fingers as the economists who wrote the paper and said, the costs the delivery costs of all manufactured goods traded both ways will fall by an additional 2% because of the elimination of non-tariff barriers that we can't see and we can't measure. They just assume that that happens. 